Hello, everyone. Thanks for making time for us this morning. I'm Frank Eigler. This is my good friend, Aaron Mary. I'm Aaron Mary, software engineer at Red Hat. Couldn't have said it better myself. So yeah, we're both uh, Red Hat employees. Uh, for some of us for quite some time, been on the periphery of the GNU and compiler kind of toolchain project for many years. So you, our names may or may not be familiar, but I know of, mo of many of you. So I mean, I'm a bit humbled by the company. But let's move on. Um, that's that's the talk. We're done. Thank you. No, but, okay, maybe you want a little more. All right, maybe I'll I'll, I'll go. We're all about uh, over in Red Hat. Uh, we work as Red Hat engineers. Uh, we have an awful lot of software that we ship. Occasionally, that software has bugs in it. We try our best that there wouldn't be, but there is bugs. And uh, when there are bugs, people need to debug that thing. When they need to debug it, we have problems. And the talk is about how to make one aspect of that problem a little more bearable in the future. So, what are we talking about? Uh, by the way, um, questions are welcome anytime. I love questions. Please ask me lots of questions. Um, if you have a problem, what do you do? You know you want a debugger because you're not one of those people who never uses debuggers. Um, but it's not as simple as just starting up GDB or whatever. Uh, you have to get things ready. Uh, now, there are prerequisites, there are data files, and that's what all this is about. Um, we're not going to talk about once your debugger is ready for use, how to use it. I expect you're an adult, and if you know you want to use a debugger, you can type the commands that, to solve your problem. I'm only talking about getting the debugger set up, in particular one aspect of it. Uh, if you use Python or other interpreted languages, I love you, but I don't want to talk to you today, so you can leave. But so this is all about the normal compiled languages that we know and love, C, C++, uh, and, and, and related languages. For example, um, Golang creates debug info that's more or less compatible. Rust creates debug info that's kind of sort of compatible. Anything that's along the normal elf, dwarf lines uh, fits this talk. Okay? So that's a, the bulk of a modern uh, Linux distribution. I still love Python, though, but I'm not talking to you still. Um, now, what if we don't want to debug, right? Uh, you might be one of those crazy people who does not like debugging. I know I said I don't like you at the beginning. It's not true. I like you. But if you don't want to use debuggers, you can use other tools that where you might need the same kind of information. There are uh, tracing tools galore that use uh, dwarf data. Um, there are profiling tools. There are binary rewriting tools. There's all kinds of stuff that consumes uh, debug data nowadays, not just uh, GDB not just GDB and its kind of tool. So even if you don't want to use GDB, think of the other favorite tool that you might use that does use debug info and, uh, and imagine I'm talking to you with some changed words. Carry on. All right, so we're talking about debug info. Um, okay, just a quick question. Everyone knows what this is, this stuff is about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking to compiler people, so I'm sorry this is beneath you, but just for completeness, I want to just skim it over rapidly. I mean, there are, there are people, they're debuggers, they're, they're developers who just don't use C flags dash G. It's, it's too good for them, it's too big for them, whatever reasons. So not everyone uses dash G. Um, everyone I know uses dash G, but that's because they're, uh, they understand this problem. Uh, dwarf debug info's purpose, again, sorry for the basic review, it is to provide metadata about your binary. It tells uh, uh, the complete story of what any sort of interrupted moment of the runtime of a program might look like so that an external tool like a debugger can uh, figure out uh, what exactly is going on there, what are all the, uh, the code locations, where are all your variables at this moment in time, um, what are all the types, all that sort of metadata that a normal compiled program doesn't need, but you do need very badly if you're in the middle of debugging. Okay, so uh, debuggers need this information because they need the users to be able to get that all this. Um, the quality of this metadata varies a great deal between tool chains. Uh, we are in uh, GCC land, just uh, new tool chain land are, are amongst the best that I know of in terms of having a really rich detailed and accurate uh, debug info for uh, normal object code, even for optimized code. Uh, so this is the work that's been going on a good decade plus uh, by Alex Oliva and others, many others, 
since those days. So uh, GCC is really, really does a good job of keeping this data, or at least generating this data in the first place. Uh, we have other tools that compress it, and I'll, it's obvious why in the next page as to why compression is necessary. Um, then there are other formats that I'm not going to go into too much detail, like uh, CTF. Um, it might come up here, and other related formats. These are basically subsets of debug info that contain just the barest um, level of info, like uh, type declarations only, or, or function um, symbol tables only, and uh, throughout all the other stuff. So those are great for their for their um, kind of limited domains. They're very convenient at times. However, um, I'm talking about the case where you need everything. And amongst the everything, uh, this will be a little refrain. It's a little inside joke between me and my slides. Don't forget about source code. You don't have to smile. I, I will smile for you about that. Uh, my point there is that uh, source code is an essential part of debugging something real. Okay, you always want to list what you're looking at. You want to list the source level stuff. It is not enough to simply get the alpha and dwarf data to a debugger type user. They need to see the source code also. Um, so, whereas very few of these uh, alpha dwarf debugger type substitutes uh, even worry about source code. It's, it's an afterthought, but I like source code. I want you to have source code. All right, so we know we'd like debug info, at least those of you who are here. Um, if you're just a developer and if you just built your own code, then this is not a problem. Then, then your debug info is right there in your uh, work directories. There's nothing for you to do. You can walk out right now and I won't mind if that's the only kind of code you build. If you built your code in such a way that, uh, that dash g was never added or uh, part of your make process involves stripping the binaries, well then uh, you shot yourself in the foot and I can't help you and no one else can. So you've got to get that dash G in there. Uh, now, these other cases, if you're, building, if you're running someone else's code, if you're uh, running uh, you know, your, your office mate's code or your distribution's code, or you're running a, a code in a container where you have practically no tooling already there, or you're debugging, or again, remotely, uh, across a network where, again, the target machine may not have any of this stuff available locally, well, that's the... That's our conversation today. So it's this depends situation where the data is not already there. You know you might need it. Um, let's talk about how you can get it. Good. Good. Uh, there haven't been any questions yet. Are you guys holding out on me? Questions? Questions? All right. I'm a little suspicious now. All right. So, oh, good. Thank you. Uh, distribution, as in like a, a Fedora, RHEL, Debian. So if you're debugging uh, a, a random program that runs on your distro, like, uh, you know, an awesome, pool, awesome tool named Poke keeps on crashing because you're an unbounded variable printing, it might happen. It might happen. If it's in your distro, you'll want to debug that Poke program, right? And you didn't build it yourself. You just got user bin Poke from the distro packages, and it crashes for some reason. Uh, so. How do you make that debuggable? That's my, it's a cool program, by the way, really. <laughs> okay, so why is debug info even uh, hard to come by? Well, it's, uh, it, everyone probably knows this stuff. It's because it's potentially huge. Uh, we're talking uh, an order of magnitude larger than the actual payload of a program in terms of its uh, executable and text segment sizes. Uh, if you had an old dot .debug uh, stuff, you get five, 15, perhaps more times larger content than you would otherwise. So it is big. And, and don't forget the source code that adds more. So almost every distro, almost every distribution of software omits all this stuff. I got some sample sizes there. Um, the top numbers are in. When you say this, what you mean is you don't have to have it on your system if you don't want it. Well, of course, uh, you don't need it to run, but it would be awful convenient if it were there, right? Like, there are all these cool old systems like Smalltalk and Lisp and stuff where when you operate the system, all the source code is there. You can interrupt at any time. You can dig, dive into everything, how it works. That's not the way the modern Linux systems are set up. You, you can start a debugger, but 
but all the information is not there for you to make progress digging in. All the debug info is shoveled out the door, and we'll talk a little bit about where it is. It's not that it's gone completely, it's just that you need to do extra work to get at it, and, and it's a hassle. And on some distros, it's not there in the first place. So anyway, uh, this is just about uh, a few random odd numbers as to the uh, amount of data involved here. And distros make the judgment that uh, shipping strip binaries, just the payload binaries, is a good, uh, good balance because most people think they will just want to run, not debug stuff. I'm different. You're different, but there we are. Okay, so I'll, I'll take a little detour into how different uh, Linux distros do this. Again, it's just a skin level uh, pass. It's not every distro, it's not every operating system, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give you a, a, a sense of how uh, the range of difference, even within this little sliver of the community. Uh, Fedora is what I'm most familiar with, for obvious reasons. And uh, they, are, um, they are one of the best in terms of how well the debug info problem has been thought out. Uh, the data is built during the build process normally. It is not lost, but separated into separate sub packages, which are then made available on uh, a separate software repository. So if you run star GDB on one of these binaries, it'll give you an instruction as to what command to run in case you don't already have the debug info installed. So, okay, so this DNF debug info install, blah, blah, blah. If you run that in theory, it'll download uh, the content for you and GDB will, will uh, next time you run it, GDB will be very happy and, and it'll smile. It'll have a, yeah. Now, that's great, but, okay, this only works if you're root, right? If you're, all these software installation commands only work if you're gonna become root for a moment at least, which sucks. I mean, in some containers you don't have root, in some environments you need permission. Uh, you have to have access to the, the, the official mirrors. You have a lot of, 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 of things that can go wrong. Um, the granularity is usually kind of broad. It, it, it means you can download the entire debug info collection for a particular package, which might involve you know, tens or hundreds of binaries, um, whereas you just need the one. Um, so this is not too bad, but, but it's still a manual process, still administrative. And uh, Ubuntu, uh, similar-ish. Um, they also build debug info usually during the build process, but they strip it away into in a, one of a couple of different ways. In a way, it's kind of been an afterthought in those communities, not as baked in as Fedora and RHEL are. Uh, you can still download them manually as a as a administrator uh, operation. On the other hand, this is made a lot, lot more clumsy than on Fedora because you have to edit uh, repository manager config files, you have to know what exact URLs are, where these debug info repositories are, and you have to do root, 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 this, root, that. It takes minutes and typos can happen. So it's available generally, but it's not great, and uh, there's not much machinery to make sure you get the exact right version. All right, uh, number three in our menu of horribles, I mean, greats, Arch Linux. Um, Arch Linux, if they're one of those guys which by default don't have dash G in the C flag, so everything is super optimized and it's like compile only code. You never can, you never debug this stuff. Um, their, <clears throat> their wiki, which is by the way awesome, uh, advises that if you need to debug something, you better recompile all the subsystems that you want to debug with additional C flags. And then of course, it's you're now like a local developer, you have all the source code and you can debug. Um, it's a different world um, out there. All right, next up. I'm not very familiar with this. I mentioned this, <clears throat> this Linux distro because it came the closest to the solution that we're converging to. Um, these kind of folks have a uh, file server idea for distributing debug info on the fly. It's close to what we need, but it just misses a few aspects. But they, have, uh, but they were, I think, the ones that came closest to this good stuff. Um, so, these are finally um, our list of requirements, or our list of, of needs, what the kinds of things that we'd like to solve. So, beyond just administrator only kind of downloading, um, beyond getting stuff only from a, an approved distribution repository, 
Um, so it gets all kinds of uh, other things become possible once you get away from the notion that debunk info is either already there or is in a, in a cloud heaven where the distributor placed them. Um, and we don't want to forget about source code again, which is in some cases um, automated, in some cases it's so-so. All right, so introducing our little widget. Uh, we've spent a few months, just a few months now, uh, prototyping a tool called uh, DBG server, something like that. Please excuse the mental conflict with GDB server. It has nothing to do with that, although, yeah, it has nothing to do with that. So please, if I stumble over my tongue, forgive me. Um, it's a tool, a service that is built as a part of the Alphutils tool set, which, do you guys know what Alphutils is? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so it's a uh, handiwork of Uli and Mark and a bunch of other people now. They're to uh, kind of like GNU bin utils. So we're proposing to put this tool into the Alphutils collection as a as a service, as a mainstream service. Uh, it's a server. Uh, it includes a little client also, so that uh, programs or the end user can easily download this stuff on the fly. It's uh, it tries to solve the minimal problem of distributing this stuff uh, by using the build ID as the key to any search, any debug, any debug info search. Yes, Nick. <laughs> I can repeat it. Isn't HTTP deprecated? Shouldn't you be using HTTPS? That's a that's a level four issue, not a level three issue. <laughs> no, it, it's a good question. Um, the security angle aspects just um, layer on top of us. So if you want HTTPS, you put a proxy server in place, you manage your own certificates and authentication and load shedding, et cetera, what you want. Just, I, I kick it off to another layer. And because it's HTTP, it'll compose very nicely with that sort of site uh, configuration. We might even be nice and give you a a prepackaged HTTP configuration file for this, but I don't want to build it all into our own code. <laughs> Sir, question? No? Do you have a question? No? Yeah, just random view. Just checking, just checking. Yeah, so th that's a fair point. There are actually some security, interesting security complications here, but um, I'll talk about them a little bit later. Let's assume that, that the world is happy and trustworthy for now. And that when you're trying to debug code, you are trusting stuff like your distribution. You're trusting your network to some extent. Anyway, I'm going to paper over that, but we have thought about it. Mark, you have a question, don't you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're going to. Um, so, you seem to care about source code, no? I do care about source code. <clears throat> it's up. Okay, it's up. Um, so, are you going to talk about that path thing? The path to the source code? Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, yes. Well, that's my question. Okay, cool. <laughs> right, uh, so Mark was asking whether we're going to deal, deal with source code, and the answer is yes. Um, so, Good, 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 good. I think this is going to be a kind of a shorter talk, so, but, so that's why I'm asking for questions, the more the merrier. Um, yes, we care deeply about source code, and which is why we're, while we're using the build ID as the identifier for any particular binary being debugged, we, oh, oh, oh. one question per, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because that's the funny thing that um, this shows do. They rewrite the path. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, how are you you uh, 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 mapping the build IDs and the paths and the possible uh, merging of paths? That is an excellent question mark. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. <laughs> No, uh, in all seriousness, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but it, at one point, uh, he's asking about what happens to to, uh, to debug info packages where the source uh, building system munges the source paths, which is what Fedora does. Some distros don't do this. 
uh, basically at uh, RPM packaging time, Fedora's RPM builders uh, rewrite the uh, source file name pointers from, to, from these temporary build trees into a relatively unique prefixed uh, string like user source debug blah 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 and whether that affects this and it sort of doesn't but I'll get to that later. Good, any other questions at this point? Yeah, but the key is uh, the build ID is what comes first and given the build ID you can ask for uh, the actual full debug info data file if the server knows it, or any source file that's referenced from that debug info file. Um, it's an unprivileged service, uh, so you no need to become root for any of this to run the server or to run a client. Yes, Nick? How, how do you ask for only a small part of the debug info? Not that... Did you look at this before? No, at this point, no. Uh, at this point, uh, we just had to keep the uh, initial service, uh, the, the model very simple, uh, simple, 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 which is you get the whole darn debug info file. That's the simplest thing because then you can cache it. You can put it into a web cache. You can shove it into a file. It's persistent. It's there. Um, Nick's question is whether you can return a piece of a debug info that you might want, like uh, some sort of offloaded query, like a debugger might ask. And now he's not listening to my answer. So I'm not talking to you again, Nick. It's over. It's over. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it at the end. It's basically future work. OK. Uh, do people know what build ID is in this group? Do you need to? A little? OK. Build ID is yet another uh, recent, brand new innovation from about 10 years ago. Uh, it's a unique uh, hash code that's encoded, that's, that's plopped into basically every ELF type binary built in the last 10 years on most distros. And that's partly because the GNU tool chain uh, defaults to adding this in at the assembler in later time. And that's just for a long time now. This was a brilliant invention by our friend Roland McGrath. Is Roland here today? No. Anywho, um, he led this work. Uh, and since then, basically every single binary you pick up or you make in the last 10 years or so will have a hash code in it that identifies that build. And that, build, that ID is kind of persistent as you distribute the software. It's, it's in the process memory image when it runs. It's in the core dumps. It's in the ELF files on disk. So it serves as a relatively unique identifier. It's long enough that we hope it will never collide. Don't talk to me about security, OK? We don't collide. Sort of. <laughs> right, and uh, so this hash code is, is everywhere. It's relatively unique, so it makes the perfect identifier for this kind of work. Okay. We're two-thirds done, which is good. And we're almost at the demo. Who'd like to rush ahead to the demo and, or versus give me a two more minutes? Two more minutes? Two more minutes. Two more minutes, okay, good. Um, running the server is... Um, just a command line kind of like that. You run it, uh, you, you give it a couple of file directories where you want it to search. It'll do a, a traversal of the file uh, hierarchies you identify looking for RPMs. It knows RPM contents right now. And it knows obviously plain old uh, ELF files. It'll index everything it finds underneath there. And uh, it'll store it in a database. So it'll index all the ELFs, all the DAR files, all the source code it can find that matches up with any of those and it plops it into a database. And once it's in the database, that data can be queried pretty much instantly from an HTTP client. The client side is uh, designed to be absolutely trivial. Uh, you give a couple of, well, you give one URL in one environment variable, and then in the AlphaUtils case, any AlphaUtils-based client like uh, SystemTap or Dynast and, and more tools in the future uh, will just automatically add that to the search path for debug info. So if it can't find a debug info locally, it'll make a quick query to, uh, to the debug server at the URL, and then it will pull that file down and it will just access that file instantly. There's no restart to GDB for the next time. There's no uh, become root and install this package. It's just quick and transparent and just uh, it just works. And there's a command line tool that just does the equivalent uh, HTTP operation. Huh. 
I'm glad you waited. Over to Aaron. <laughs> All right, so debug info server is packaged with a shared library, libdbg server, that enables other tools to query debug info servers for debug info, executables, and source files, like Frank mentioned. Um, so two tools we've been working on adding libdbg server support to are SystemTap and GDB. Uh, in cases where these tools are not able to locate the source files or debug info, uh, we've added simple fallbacks that call libdbg server functions uh, for querying the debug info servers. Um, SystemTap inherits debug info server support automatically since it uses the lfutils library functions that this uh, libdbg server library hooks into. As for GDB, we've prepared a small patch that adds the fallbacks to GDB's logic for uh, locating source files and separate debug info. How big are those patches? That <laughs> Very short, like I think like less than 50 lines, something like that. Um, so now I'll briefly demo system tap and GDB support for uh, debug info server. So we have an example system tap script, para call graph dot stp. Um, oops. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure how to how to improve that. Oh, yeah. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, we have our para call graph script. So this system tap script prints a microsecond time call graph of a specified executable. It includes function parameters and return values in the call graph. In order for this script to run, system tap needs to be able to find the executable's debug info. So suppose I want to produce a call graph for the tree command, which uh, you probably know produces a uh, list of directory contents in a tree format. Uh, so this laptop does not have the tree debug info RPM installed. So when I attempt to run the system tap script, it will produce an error. So the script I'm running, uh, yeah, failed, the pass to analysis failed, was not able to locate the debug info. So now I can use debug info server to easily get uh, access to tree's debug info. So I have that debug info in a directory called RPM, and I'll point debug info server to it, increase the verbosity, point it to that directory. Wait. Oh, yeah. No. Excellent. So yes, hopefully you can see now that there's a debug info file found and some source files. So uh, when we run tree again, or sorry, when we run uh, the stap script again, this time, system tap successfully starts running the script. I can close, uh, terminate debug info server since system tap now has a copy of the debug info. And when I run tree, uh, we get the the call graph complete with all the information we were looking for. So now I'll, run, I'll show debug info server running with GDB. Just get rid of this. Oops. Okay, so suppose we want to debug a program within a Fedora container. So there's the cached container image. I built a container image that includes GDB, libdbg server, and uh, executable that's been stripped of its debug info. This executable is just a trivial program that prints the name of the function it's in. Very simple program. Um, since the container image doesn't include uh, the executable prog. It doesn't include its debug info or source code. Um, when I run the container and run GDB within it, uh, it's not going to be able to find the debugging symbols. Oh, no, that's not right. Six zero four two. Okay, so now we're inside the container. If I run prog with GDB, no debugging symbols are found. Um, so now I have a uh, progs build tree, which contains the strip debug info and the source code. I'm also going to point, D I, I get GDB and DBG server confused. <laughs> uh, debug info server, I'll point it to lib, the glibc debug info RPM, just so we can also debug any 
uh, calls the glibc functions within prog. So debug info server, turn up the verbosity, point it to our build tree and our RPM directory. It's going to take a moment to traverse the uh, glibc RPM. Okay, so you can see that we found almost 400 debug info files and about 34,000 source files. When I run GDB again, this time it successfully finds the symbols for prog, uh, downloads them to a, a cache within the container, and we can, uh, when we list the source code, um, more requests are made to debug info server for prog source code. I can also debug glibc functions this way. I can set a breakpoint on printf. Uh, GDB queries debug info server for whatever resources it's lacking. So it queried it for printf.c within glibc's debug info, and at some point it queried debug info server for the glibc, um, the, the, the library's debug info. And as we step into further glibc functions, uh, GDB will query debug info server for whatever it's lacking on the spot and save it to a local cache if desired. And that's it for our demo. Holy cow, it worked. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Go ahead, Nick. Good. Um, can you empty the cache? Uh, on the client side, uh, we, I will talk about it in just a second. It's, it's self-managing. So yeah, it, it's just a flat dead directory and uh, the library itself uh, doesn't, does management of the cache. It can limit it to, to certain sizes or certain ages and stuff. We'll, we're still working on the details. And can you specify multiple debug info servers? Of course. <laughs> All right, you're in my good books again. <laughs> Earlier you said you were putting this into elf utils, but when I look at the demo and what you've talked about, I don't understand What's the component of the server that actually requires anything from the elf utils? Why isn't it just a dumb file server? Well, it, it, uh, it is itself an elf utils app based application because in order to index elf files and RPMs and the elf stuff inside that, it needs to use elf utils functions to parse that stuff in the first place. Now, but, why, the, but, but that's my question, like what does it need to do to do that? Because like, like GDB sends it a build ID and gets dwarf back you know, gets like some file back. Yep. Why does that require indexing anything? Imagine where you have not just one small number of binaries that, that Aaron's demo had where you have three or four, but you have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of binaries like a real distro has. You need an index to be able to serve that kind of request quickly. So you need some software that is going to scan over uh, a potentially large, large, large library of, of files uh, and distribution artifacts and stuff that can then, on request, be that fast when a GDB or some other user wants, needs some info back. So you need an index made. Now, that obviously needs software that does the indexing. Uh, whether this piece of software has to reside within the AlphaUtils uh, repository as a as an included package or somewhere else, I don't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the client side is nice in AlphaUtils because then every other program that uses it automatically benefits. Um, where the server sits is a, is a project management issue, not really a technical issue. Does that answer your question or maybe it was a different tangent? Yeah, I don't think it does, but that's okay. Hi, I, I guess the question could be, why do you, do you index? If we consider that the backend, the files will already be laid out in such a way where you already have the build IDs there, so you could just open the file. Yeah. Well, th this is for the case where the files are not already there. That's the point, right? So we're talking with a, about a but machine I mean on the server. where there is nothing on a local machine, right? In this case, the, his container demo had nothing other than a GDB binary and the target binaries in the container. So there was no debug info installation there at all to begin with. But I mean on the, on the server. so. The client side asks, give me this source file inside. This looks like a path. Mm -hmm. And at the, at the left side has this hash. Mm -hmm. And why doesn't the server just look up that 
path locally in the file system instead of going via an index. I think okay. that's more um, All right, so you're imagining a scenario where the uh, web API is literally a file service kind of hierarchy. For that to work, you have to unpack all the RPMs that you'll ever want to serve something from. Okay. And if you want to unpack um, all 77 terabytes of the Fedora RPM repository, <laughs> uh, those are compressed RPMs, just on the odd case that someone might want uh, you know, a Fedora 18 copy of bin ls, um, then that is a legitimate way of doing it. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if someone on a lark, maybe we'll do it after the, the talk here, implements a, a toy that has exactly the same web API and just does based on already extracted files in an, in a, already arranged into that beautiful hierarchy. But uh, I think from a pragmatic point of view, it is better to have an index that, uh, that, relate, that refers to RPMs and other files in their natural habitat, not forcing them to be uh, extracted, taking up all this gargantuan amount of space just in case someone will want something from them. So the uh, whole aspect of this tool is to index this in such a way that does not require any of this to be persistently unpacked anywhere. It's all done on the fly uh, without any of this large uh, state usage. Does it make some more sense? I think so, yes. Okay. That was a good question. I'll give you that. <laughs> so, so this works with both. Uh, oh, sorry. But it seemed to work with both. Exploded and... Right. If, I mean, if you have an exploded directory already, then, you, then it, it still gives you an index, right? Because even then, you won't have... Uh, your, your build tree is not set up with build IDs already in the path, right? Build IDs are something hidden inside the ALF files. This is not a totally trivial mapping. So there's some processing needs to be done to present um, arbitrary files, arbitrarily named ELF dwarf files as a, unif as a understandable hierarchy that's you know, pr practical for usage. Where was I? I was here, page 18. Okay, um, just a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. It, given that it's a file server, it, it, it's, it's a file server out of an index, there's not that much that it does. And, and you're right to intuit that it, there's not very much there. Um, from the philosophy of not taking up any extra room, not asking a sysadmin or a, you know, a build, a relange type person to explode every build tree into this kind of hierarchy, we adapt instead to what's already there. We adapt to the status quo practices instead of asking them to adapt to us. How about that? So we just take the RPMs where they are, we just take the VARA files where they already are, and we find them, we index them, so that wherever they already are, they can be found again. Um, the resolution of source files is, in fact, quite tricky, um, especially when uh, sources are packaged in RPMs that are physically separate from the RPMs that contain the debug info or the executables. There has to be some matching and we don't want to do this matching by, again, exploding everything and matching things up. So there's some, maybe, the, maybe that's the most clever bit of the code is to just have some little look aside brief tables of partial indexes, which then some magic SQL matches up. You don't want to know. Uh, it, it is not as trivial as it might seem, but it's, but it's good fun stuff. Uh, so indexing is a time-taking process, um, but answering a query is practically instantaneous, which is, I think, what the, the right balance of, of cost. Um, this is going behind the curtains. Maybe I'll just stand behind. No, I won't stand behind the curtains. This is all internal information that's just uh, for those who like reading about this kind of stuff. Um, I have become a big fan of SQLite over the last little while, for uh, not just in terms of the quality of the code, but the documentation is incredible, uh, and the robustness, and it's just really, really well thought out stuff. So for like single process, relational-like databases, you can't beat SQLite as far as I know. So, so we use it, of course. And we use a proper little relational uh, system, very small, very simple, um, to track, to create this index. Um, it's, it's normalized because it has to be, because uh, 
many of these strings get to be very large and replicated tens or hundreds of times depending on the files. So we have to use you know, interlinked uh, relational tables. Old stuff, this is 1980s database technology, but, um, but it's necessary because things can get really large. Um, SQLite is really nice because you end up with a dead file which you can then take from one machine to another. You can, once an index is generated, you can take it elsewhere. You can have multiple servers uh, looking at the same index. And it's very straightforward, good, good, really well-written tool set. I'm, I can't say compliment it enough times. It's pretty good. The client stuff is even simpler, obviously. It is nothing other than an HTTP client or HTTPS. You. Um, or it can be an FTP client, uh, any old thing. It, it's just, a, a, as far as it's concerned, it's simply a single, um, very simple URL request to a server. And conceivably, the server could be impersonated by a dead file directory that looks just like that with the build ID directories as Tom imagined. That would actually work fine as far as a client's concerned. So I'm not making use HTTP if you don't want to. Um, any files it downloads, it, like, lo it manages a little local cache, uh, which is time limited and stuff, and we're gonna manage it all to be uh, sane. But it's basically that's uh, the local client have a file descriptor or a file name into the cache, which then it can use as long as it likes. The fun stuff here is that uh, the client code is also built into the server, and that enables all kinds of other fun stuff. So this comes back, oh, oh, Mark. This is your sixth question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So the federation can be done on the client side and the server side? That's correct. Okay. Well, I, 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 a client can, 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 can call multiple servers, and a server can itself call multiple servers for information it doesn't have. So I, I consider the federation to be a server side phenomenon, but it comes from the same mechanism. So, was there another question? Oh my God, I wish I could throw a candy at you for a reward because I really appreciate more questions. Um, can the server spot when new um, debug packages are being added or does it have to be restarted each time? Um, does it you know, have a, some sort of monitor thing for a, an area? Yeah, I... Do, 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 I didn't spell that part out, I apologize. I should have spelled that. It's not very smart at the moment. It does just a periodic rescan of those directories that you tell it, and it, it caches the M time of all the files it looks at. So it only looks at a file once, um, but if every couple of minutes or however you frequently you like, it'll look back and find new files that have, might have appeared there automatically. It'll do that and it'll notice them, it'll index, add them to the index. It's not super, it doesn't use iNotify and all these newfangled 1993 technologies yet. But uh, given that we cache via M time, it's not too bad. It's actually pretty fast, even with a very large uh, backend that doesn't change much. Yeah, the main thing is if it's a big server, you don't want it to be restarted every time a new package gets uploaded. No, and, and absolutely. We, but the nice thing is this index is a, a persistent SQLite database. So if you kill your debug server, and you load it back up again, all the cache metadata, all the index is already there. So it will not waste time re-scanning RPMs it already knows because it already knows it has analyzed them before. So you can in fact kill it, restart it, it's instantaneous. Make sense? Good, we're more or less on time. Nick, this is question number, you're going over your quota. <laughs> um, so given I have a, a client that wants to access this debug information, yes. is, is it easy to do? Do you have documentation on, on how to do it and how I can change, modify my client? Why, do you work on a tool set by any chance that might want to do this? I do. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, yes, uh, so there's both a library, a very trivial library, uh, which has man pages. It's the, now the second set of Alpha Utils components with man pages. And there's a command line tool also that's equivalent. And uh, the GV patches were put up by our good friend uh, about two weeks ago. So you can see them. And they're actually really, really, really simple. They really want to be simple. So yes, please, we'll add them to Bing Utils. <coughs> Bing Utils. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, why do we want to federate? Uh, 
I like federation. A concept makes sense to everyone. Is it a weird term, or do you understand? It's the idea of putting a debug info server in some sort of tree uh, where a server might know that it doesn't have all the information, so it asks another server for the exact same information. So this makes perfect sense if uh, you run a personal server for all your build trees on your local workstations, and then your team runs another server for all the builds that are shared between your team members, but, but uh, you might not have access to the raw build trees. You might want um, a geographically distributed version of these servers. Uh, you might definitely want one where your distro runs one or more, maybe for each major version of your distro. And you want these servers to just talk to each other automatically when a client asks pretty much any of them for a particular debug info or a particular build ID. So by virtue of letting a server be a client by the exact same uh, URL mechanism, this just works. It's just a matter of configuring each server with a list of upstream servers that it wants to talk to, and that just works instantaneously. Oh, jeez. All right, what is it now, Nick? <laughs> so suppose I, I have a program that's not part of an official distribution and I want to be able to publish its debug info. Mm -hmm. Do I have to make my, I have to set up a debug info server for it, presumably, um, and then can I get that server to tell other servers it's there? No, it, it, it's, how, how, that would be way how does clever. the user of my packet, my program, get at my debug info? How, how do I tell the user, how do I publish it for the tools that the user is going to use? Um, you have to, expose your data somehow okay so uh, however you would have done it now if you have a the same way that you public, give your binaries to your user you have to give them either a binary or a server from where they can download your binary from right now it's that same parallel mechanism that you'd want to do if you set up a debug info server at that same kind of user to you interface point if you have if you want to put your um Let's say you're running out of time, but it's a question number eight. No, it's a good one. Um, so debug info servers don't talk to each other except in by saying that if I don't have this data, I will ask these three friends of mine for data. Um, if you have a totally separate build system where you have your own binaries and you're distributing your own binaries to a, to a client, you'd need to find a way of either getting your debug info to any of the servers that are already being used by users, so whether a distro or whether a team project sort of debug server, or you run your own, um, that's probably the option. What I would like is if I install an RPM, I would, like, I would like the installing the RPM process to also install the path to the debug server, debug info server. I, I don't see why that couldn't happen. It's just a, a matter of adding uh, an environment variable to the default shells, if, if you're going to do that. that. That's not too hard to automate. Well, I, I, so there's work to be done in, in making this deployment as fit as many possibilities as possible. So it's a real, it's a, it's a reasonable question. Hmm. Okay, I think I'll just finish this part. All right. Maybe, uh, Frank. Holy macro! Awesome. Hey, on. Uh, given that uh, even one of the debug info files can be pretty big, for example, compressed uh, WebKit debug info file is half a gigabyte, uh, have you considering uh, somehow do range-based uh, GET requests and, for example, download just GDB index first and then just downloading uh, the separate the compilation units which needs to be accessed? then there should be, there are some options for acceleration just so that we don't have to download file header first, section head table afterwards, strings, so that it can already, for example, send just uh, the GDB index we ask for and then it, it can automatically send the backline section corresponding to the request yep. compilation in it and such stuff. So I, I get what you're asking for, uh, some higher level, more, uh, more application-oriented type of queries. So when they, so the granularity is not a, an entire file, but a segment of a file. Uh, at this point, no, we don't do that. And I would love to get to there. I want to make sure to get something very, very simple and easy to understand, easy to manage out there as a first step. And then um, I'm very interested in, in just that kind of extrapolation to the future into answering structural queries um, and offload basically the computation to a server. But that's later. Um,
good. This is how you can look at the code today, if you wish. Uh, there's, a, there's a Fedora binary that's pre-built for you. Um, it's, just, it's just normal source. It's a C++ code, so please, I apologize. Um, I like C++. Um, it's a normal multi-threaded small program. It's not, not very much. Um, we hope to get it into ALF utils without, uh, with it before too long. So it'll be on your normal distros before too long. Um, all these things we would like your help with, either help with or spend our own time with over time. The, uh, the very last bullet answers Yannick's question as a future item. I apologize. <laughs> but it is on the radar. It is just not there uh, right now. And uh, I, I totally anticipate getting a deb package format in there very shortly because it's a very it's a simple thing to just decompress a deb file on the fly just like it's easy to decompress an rpm on the fly it's uh, it, this will be there very shortly so it's not just for us uh, rpm people um middle bullet i know there are a bunch of compiler people here please make sure as a personal favor to me and people i love that the, the debug info quality that your tool creates is, stays as high as possible. Um, debuggability of highly optimized programs is a must in, in our world. And if you can afford to make, make the, the debug info as good quality as possible, don't break it, don't strip it, just make it good, please. I will thank you, I will buy you lunch, and our users will be very happy. Finally, a few token URLs, and we have Four, no, five minutes and ten seconds for a few more questions from Mark and Nick and anyone else. <laughs> uh, so why this is a part of Elfusel's project? Uh, I'll just have a look uh, how it touches other parts of Elfusel's and it really doesn't except one place where it hooks in a hack of some kind that they'll opens libgdb server and looks some symbol there and invokes it. So why it, is it Elfutils? Why not? <laughs> part, uh, part because it why not, right? doesn't integrate into Elfutils. So that's why I'm asking this. It, 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 in principle, it could be anywhere else. It, it, from, uh, from my point of view, I like minimizing the number of distinct packages that, that exist out there. If a, if a piece of function is pretty close to something that's there already, it, it's a tool set that's or, that, that deals with Elf. And if the maintainer doesn't mind us squatting in there and it fits in well, I think it's I think, I think there's a problem. I, I don't want to create a whole brand new project, push it through all the various management systems, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that. So, but the, the interface points between Alfutil's core and this on the client side as well as on the server side are pretty pretty small. It could be an external thing. Thank you. Anyone else? Pedro. Uh, so what will happen when someone inevitably will want to support this on MinGW, which is not ELF, it's COF? I hate you right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Microsoft has its own uh, cool world. I don't know if you guys know the um, um, a symbol server concept from Microsoft is, is a well-established thing. It's the closest thing they have to this or vice versa. Um, so I would imagine my, people who run Windows will want to use the source ser or symbol server stuff, which Microsoft makes available to other people to use too. It's a downloadable thing. So I would just say, if you're using Ming, MinGW, you're running Windows code, use the Windows tooling. But um, it's not really on my radar. If you think it should be, then come talk to me and buy me a beer. Anything else? Nope. Awesome. Thank you guys very, very much for your time. I really enjoyed the questions and the to and fro. And I want to thank Aaron again for that really smooth working demo. That was awesome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>